without further ado, I'll just quickly introduce myself, Dr. Krinman. I'm a medical advisor and a prescribing physician at Alloy, um, and also um, board certified OBGYN menopause specialist, um, and also long-term breast cancer survivor, and was part of bringing M4, you know, to Alloy and help developing it. And just really honored. I've learned so much about this during this whole journey um, with Dr. From, from Dr. Gendler, I should say. So I'll let you introduce yourself. So thank you for being here. Hey. Hi. Hi, Corinne. I'm Ellen Gendler. I'm a board certified dermatologist in New York City. I teach at NYU Langone Medical Center for many, many, many years. And how did I even come to be on this webinar? Um, it's interesting because probably 25 years ago, I had a patient, an elderly woman, maybe she was in her, maybe she was around 82, and she looked absolutely incredible. And I said to her, what's your secret? And she told me that she had been using her vaginal estrogen cream for God knows how long. And it was really impressive to me. And at the time, I just had this idea, you know, I was like 40 and I thought, you know something, I'm going to try using that on myself. And, and how could I possibly go wrong? And I started using it really just around my eyes. And I really liked it. And it seemed as though my my eyes were not aging as, as fast as the rest of me. And I started prescribing it to patients. And I've been doing so for the last 25 years. You know, sometimes I get pushback from dermatologists prescribing topical estrogen, vaginal estrogen, but it didn't matter to me. And I think it's worked incredibly well. And that's how I got into this, um, you know, sort of became known for, as a dermatologist who did that. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and I think this is how, you know, this is like the art of medicine, right? Like listening to patients, like using like common sense, because, you know, as a physician and a dermatologist, you understand the impacts of menopause on women's skin. So from your perspective, can you just tell the audience, let's like give them, you know, kind of basic physiology, what's happening, you know, from perimenopause into menopause in terms of skin health? Well, I assume that all of you are basically in that point of your life and you're starting to notice these things. And honestly, from perimenopause to menopause, there's a pretty big change. So we know that when estrogen declines in this period of time, a lot of things happen. Your skin becomes thinner, your skin becomes drier, you make less oil, um, your collagen diminishes, your elastin diminishes, your your height, the skin hydration is worse. So many things happen. And so we work to figure out how topical estrogen can help these parameters. And this is not a new concept, believe me, not new at all. Um, yeah. So will you, so in terms of it not being a new concept and, and just to the point of the physiology, the menopause society position statement has an excellent overview of the physiology of what, what's happening and, you know, kind of just, you know, backing up everything that you've just like laid out, but from a, an interesting historical perspective, I think this is a really fun story that a lot of people don't know about how topical estrogens kind of came to be in terms of the aesthetic, you know, cosmetic world. So can you tell that story? Well, you know, topical estrogen has been used since the 1920s when Max Factor released their first hormone cream. I forget what the name of it was, but women were using it all the time. And then of course their biggest competitor was Helena Rubinstein and they launched theirs and this just kept going. Companies were, were uh, making these ads about how beautiful you look and how your partner will just think you're ravishing and really horrible sexist ads. <laughs> but the bottom line was that it was clear that estrogen was making these women's skin look really good. And this went on till I, I think it's around the 1940s when the FDA started to come down on more or less drug claims. And they didn't say that estrogen was dangerous, but they said they needed studies. And this kept going until I believe somewhere in the, like in the 70s when estrogen just left the market. A, you never saw estrogen in creams again. And then of course the WHI study just put the kibosh on everything and estrogen was done. It was done, topical estrogen done. It, and, and do you know at all what 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 percentage or what they were using back then in those cosmetics? Yeah, I have yeah. no idea. I don't know if anybody yeah. knows that. And, and I mean, like I, some of it was good though that the cosmetic industry was regulated, right? That like you're putting yeah, things totally in to regulate the drugs, right? And then you allude to the WHI, which we talked about a lot on here, and we learned a lot of wonderful things from the WHI. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, but. There in 2002, when it was released, the, the messaging that went out, the media mis-messaging, I would say, caused a lot of fear. And I really think like 
you know, interest and appetite to put research dollars into anything to do with estrogen was just like gone. And right. so we basically have a generation decades where this has not been talked about. So it seems like it's new, but to your point, it's actually not new and you've clinically used it for a long time. Right. right. Um, and so can you talk briefly about what the research that is there, you know, the, the research studies that are there on topical estrogens and maybe kind of like link it to what we do know about the FDA approved topical vaginal estrogen, which we have decades of safety data on it. And it's really okay, in my opinion, to draw a lot of conclusions on that data because we're all, we're just talking about skin, right? Totally. And you know, well, I have so much to say. I could fill this whole webinar with that mm -hmm. one but let me just say that as physicians, we use medications off-label all the time, so many ways. So the fact that there exists a, an FDA-approved vaginal estrogen, there's no reason why you can't experiment and use it on other parts of the body, but you have to do that intelligently. The studies on topical estrogen are not new. It's not that in the last two years, you know, since companies like Aloy were created or however, whatever the number of years is, that this suddenly happened. In the 1990s, they were studying topical estrogen. There are lots and lots and lots of studies. Now, did these studies go on for 20 years? No, they did not. But there are some really good studies. Some of them are double blinded. Some of them included skin biopsies. And some of them were merely observational studies. But there was a reason for them because there was interest, okay, even in the 1990s. And in the early 2000s, ditto. I could show you dozens and dozens of studies, and some people would critique some of these studies, but they are good studies. Maybe some of them aren't the most fantastic studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but they're excellent studies, many of which are um, random, they're just uh, vehicle controlled, you know, double blinded studies, and they're very worth looking at. And so those are the studies that you're referencing for facial topical estrogen. Correct. But you and I also could quote the thousands of studies and data points that we have enough so that vaginal estrogen is FDA approved, has been FDA approved for decades, and now in the UK um, is over the counter. Like, let's make that point, right? So, you know, what do we know about how vaginal estrogen works and how effective and safe it is? Like, what are the basic bullet points there? Well, it's, you know, we know that it's safe. We know that it helps, uh, you know, it helps in sexual issues. It helps in the gen in the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. There's so many positive attributes of estrogen vaginally. And the skin of the vaginal walls is very thin. So it made sense to me way back in the day to try using vaginal estrogen on thin skin on the face and maybe on the tops of the hands, the areas where people complain the earliest about thinning. So the area under the eyes, although it has an epidermis, which the vaginal skin doesn't, it still is the most comparable in terms of thickness. And there's so many interesting points about the vaginal estrogen studies. Number one, there was very insignificant systemic absorption from vaginal estrogen. But, and you, Corinne, can explain this to me. At some point, and I don't remember how many years ago, the recommended doses, say, in Vagifem went from being 25 to 10. And I'm not sure whether that was because there was systemic absorption. You can speak to that. But what was really interesting to me is that the, when they tested the systemic levels, which were low or almost imperceptible, they were higher on the first day of use of vaginal estrogen than they were at day 14. So what that tells us is that the systemic absorption, if there even is any, is less as the skin or the epithelium thickens. And that's really important to know. It's super important. I'm so glad you brought that up because we hear that discussion a lot about, you know, any kind of concerns about even a slight about a slight amount of systemic absorption in say breast cancer survivors who are taking aromatase inhibitors or adjuvant endocrine therapy to keep their estrogen levels really low. We can, and we do use vaginal estrogen for those women. And we have looked at what happens with serum levels. And to your point, particularly when women have very severe vaginal atrophy, you'll see a little tick up, not in, not above menopausal levels, but a little tiny tick up in the first two weeks. And then it comes right back down to baseline as very rapidly that skin thickens and becomes healthier, which then makes it not as susceptible to getting like systemic exposure. And in terms of the dosing, yes, the 25 you know, milligrams was 
was a, a higher dose and you know you use a higher dose in the top of a you know the vaginal canal you're going to have a little bit more chance of absorption so then the studies just showed we can use lower amounts and still get the efficacy so hence we can translate a lot of that knowledge to using very low dose um, can you just talk briefly about estradiol versus estriol? Well, estradiol is more potent than estriol. So when you're using a topical estriol, while the results are very comparable, it's still a lower strength. So, yeah. you know, and, and using topical estriol does not raise the systemic levels of estradiol. Yeah. And I think this is important. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit of, uh, more about the M4 study, so M4's alloys version of topical estriol. And in our M4 study, um, we looked at estradiol as well as estriol levels just to you know, really provide assurance at baseline um, midway through and at 12 weeks. And there was no increase in either estradiol or estriol. And biologically, estriol does not get converted back to estradiol. Right. So and that's Dr. important. Ren, why don't you just explain the difference between them? When do we have higher levels yeah. of estriol? When do we have estradiol? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So estradiol is kind of the main estrogen that we think of for women's reproductive function. It's what makes your breast grow and your uterine lining to thicken up in preparation for a pregnancy. It's, you know, what you know impacts all of the receptors in your body for you to grow into, you know, as a woman and, you know, support everything. Now, estriol is the primary hormone of pregnancy and the levels of estriol are in the, you know, thousands and thousands when you're pregnant, right? And so your body is flooded with high levels of estriol during pregnancy. And what's interesting is estriols, you know, we the physiology of it, 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 it is very weak stimulant on breast tissue and uterine lining tissue. Um, it's really a much less potent and weaker form of estrogen, right? Um, and so uh, the, like you referenced, the studies in the past on topical facial estrogens, some of them used estriol, some of them used estradiol. And when we were formulating the M4, we just went with the estriol because this is a compounded product, right? So we were trying to lean on the side of safety, you know, as the top kind of priority. Um, and while estradiol would be quite safe too, and you've got lots of experience using it topically from a vaginal form, um, you know, we chose to go with estriol. So I think they're both valid estriol, options. Estriol is what they use in Europe. They don't even use yes. estradiol, right? No, yeah, yeah. The standard of care for vaginal estrogen in Europe is estriol. And that's what's actually approved for over-the-counter use in vaginal stuff. 